tonight. So we're going to be looking at Romans 4, 1 through 15. And, and the theme of the study is justified by faith. So I'll begin reading at verse 1 in the book of Romans. I'll read to verse 4. I'll do some introductory comments. I'm going to be sharing with you a couple of definitions, things that you're going to need to know as we go through Romans. And, uh, and then we'll get into the verses in front of us. So beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 4, Romans chapter 4. Paul writes, What then shall we say that Abraham, our father, has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now, to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. And so at this point, what we're going to be looking at and what is happening is the Apostle Paul is developing what is called the doctrine of justification. I'm going to give you some, some definitions so that we can flow through that as we continue our study through Romans. So I'll give you a couple of definitions that will help you to understand the points that he's making. But he's developing the doctrine of justification. Now, he's already referred to this in his first chapter, in chapter 1, verse 17, when he said the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And so what is Paul teaching us in this verse? Well, one, he's speaking to us concerning the righteousness of God. Now, God's righteousness is revealed by his acting in accordance to his nature. See, by nature, God is pure. He's just, and his actions are consistent with his nature. God's actions are pure and just. Now, because all of us have sinned, we cannot attain righteousness by our good works. Our sinful nature is in rebellion and our works are tainted by sin. Even the best thing that we do without Christ is tainted. It's going to have something that, that really pertains to me. It's going to be something that I might glory in. So even my best works without Christ are tainted by sin. And so, our sinful nature being in rebellion, well, that means that our works are tainted by our sin. So, to save us, he gave his son so that we could receive something we didn't have, something we don't have, and that is his righteousness. And that, Paul has been saying, comes through faith in Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross. It's in this way that the believer becomes right with God and forgiven of sins. We went through recently in our Sunday morning in the Gospel of Mark, how that Jesus died on that cross for us. We just celebrated the resurrection of Christ in Easter. We celebrated Good Friday in recognition of the things that he did. The purpose Christ had in coming was to lay his life down for the sin of the world. He's the Lamb of God who does so. Why did he do so? It's because he wanted to rescue us. He didn't come to be served, but to, but to serve, and to, he said, and to give his life a ransom for many. So he came to purchase us, to redeem us. And in doing so, by saving us, when we place our faith in Christ, we receive something from him that we didn't have. We receive his righteousness. God makes us righteous. And so by the Spirit and by the Word, he empowers us to be righteous. So Christians are, are made righteous because we're right with God. We're in a right relationship. And that, again, is the righteousness that results from faith in Jesus Christ. Now, in chapter 3, in verse 22, Paul had said, This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. And there is no distinction. And so righteousness is, is, is doing that which is right. Now, justification is uh, what we're looking at also, and that is a, a term that is used in the judicial sense. And as I'm looking out here, there's quite a number of people. As I'm looking out, you probably know what that means. The judicial sense. I know John does. What is justification? Well, justification is God declaring the sinner to be totally free of the guilt of sin. Totally free. Not just a little bit free, not partially free, but completely free. And that's something that I, that I like to remember because... No longer am I in bondage to sin. I have the freedom that comes through Christ. And that is a very important thing for us to know. You see, in the, in the New Testament, um, God makes the believer in Jesus Christ 
righteous. And it's through justification that he completely forgives our sin. In Romans 3.24, Paul had said, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So in justification, something is removed. Our guilt, our guilt before God is removed. And not only is the guilt removed, but the judgment that comes because of our sin is also removed. In John 5, 24, it says, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. You shall not come into judgment. You're not going to stand before the judgment seat of God at that great white throne judgment. You're not going to do that. Why? Because Jesus took the penalty for your sin. You've been justified. We have everlasting life. It is a present tense condition. We have age-abiding life. We're right with God, and we are going to continue on into eternity. That's so amazing. It just blows my mind. In Psalm 103, 10 through 12, the psalmist said this. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our, in our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. I mentioned to you that if you, in, before, if you had a globe and you started going, we'll say at the top of the globe, and you start going down, you're going south, eventually, you'll be, when you get to the bottom, you're going to come up and you're going to, from the north to the south, you'll go back from the south to the north. We know that. But if you start from east to west, and you begin to circle that globe, you never, ever go in the opposite direction. So he didn't say God separates us, our sins from us from the north to the south. He said God separates our sins from us as far as the east is from the west. That tells us they'll never be brought up again. They are completely, completely forgiven. So not only is something removed, but something else is received. You see, the one declared not guilty receives righteousness, and that comes as a revelation of God's grace to us through Jesus Christ. You see, we have broken God's laws, but Jesus never did. Jesus never committed any sin. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 22, Peter said that Jesus committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. In the book of Hebrews, the writer in chapter 4, verse 15 said this, We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. So that made him worthy to, to that made him able to give a worthy sacrifice. That made him able to redeem us. In Galatians 3.13, Paul said, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it's written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. We already saw in Ephesians when we went through that book, Ephesians 1 verse 7, in him, in Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. And that's what Paul is talking about as we look at this passage now. And so we'll begin. That was your introduction. Let's get into our study in verse 1. So he says, what then shall we say that Abraham, our father, has found according to the flesh? <laughs> Paul has just said that the law is not made void through faith. The fact is, he said, the law, the law of Moses is established because we have exercised faith. And so to build this premise, Abraham is introduced because he's the father of the Jews. And Abraham is regarded as the ultimate example of a man who was right with God. Again, he's the father of the Jews. Who was Abraham? Well, Abraham lived around 2000 B.C. He was from an area called Ur of the Chaldees. That would mean that his birthplace would be located today in southern Iraq. Now, during his day, Ur was estimated to have around 300,000 inhabitants. That doesn't sound like much to us today, 
But at that time, that was an incredibly huge city, 300,000. It was located on the Euphrates River, 100 miles north of the Persian Gulf. That means that they were involved in commercial trade. They were also educated. They were educated in math, agriculture, weaving, engraving, and astronomy. But they also were known for something called idolatry. In Joshua 24, verse 2, it reads that Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood in old times, even Terah, the father of Abraham and the father of Nahor, and they served other gods. So Abraham dwelt in a city amongst a people that were idolaters. As I was reading up on this and researching a bit, his father and grandfather, uh, commentators were pretty much convinced that they themselves were also idolaters. And so Abraham came out of an area of idolatry. And yet in the midst of all of this, when you read your scriptures concerning this, God called him and God promised to bless him and he left his home country. He responded to God by obeying him and he was motivated, and this is the point that Paul is making, he was motivated by faith. The writer of Hebrews in chapter 11, verse 8, says it like this. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. Now, the question that's being asked and that Paul is actually answering is this. Was Abraham justified by anything that he and his flesh did? Was Abraham justified by the energy of his own good works? And is that how he became right with God? By his works. Did he become right with God by doing the things that he did? Well, Paul is saying no, because in verse 2, if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. If he worked hard to become righteous, then he would take credit for it. Self-made righteousness would give him cause to brag about himself. I remember a fellow when I was first saved, I forget his name. It doesn't really matter anymore. But he, he, he was an older man. Again, he, he had to be at least 50. <laughs> I was 20. So, you know, okay, anybody here who's young, you know what I mean. So, so to me, he was like grandpa, right? So, but he, had, he told me that he had gotten saved. But this is a guy that was always bragging. I mean, he's, he, he just liked to boast. And, and, and it got under my nerves. And again, I'm a brand new Christian. What do I know? But I knew that it's not good to brag. So I told him that. I said, you know, you know, God doesn't really like bragging and boasting. You know, he, he says, oh, he says, I, I don't brag and I don't boast. He says, I'm a humble man. <laughs> then he said, I'll never forget. Then he said, I'm the most humble man I know. So he even <laughs> boasted in his humility. I thought that was amazing. But you see, when you do your works, what happens if you're trying to achieve righteousness by your works, Paul is saying, that if you were even able to do that, you would boast in your own righteousness, which would make you self-righteous, which would mean that you're unsaved because God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And so anybody who would say Abraham by his works was made righteous would be wrong. And Paul is pointing that out. You see, that's why he is called the father of faith. He was justified by his faith and not by his works alone. In James 2.23, it says, The scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. That word imputed, it was imputed. That means to be credited or reckoned. So he became righteous, not by his own works. He became righteous. Because he had faith and trusted the Lord and through faith obeyed God. Now he says again, he says, uh, But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Okay, now I want to develop this for a second. But to him who does not work, but believes. But believes. That word is thrown around so much today, you have to actually kind of define it a bit. 
Because, you know, people believe a lot of things. I believe it's going to rain. I believe I'm hungry. I, you know, I believe, I believe. We, we believe so many different things, right? To believe in the biblical sense is to put all of your faith into something, to trust something entirely. It, it, it isn't something that you do halfway. You don't believe today and not believe tomorrow. It's something that you do completely. It's something that you trust totally in. And the Bible tells us that we are to trust, and that's what that faith is what results in our salvation. Remember in John chapter 14 how Jesus in John 13 had been speaking to his men. It was the last night that he'd be instructing them. And in chapter 13, he had been sharing quite a number of things with them concerning what was about to take place. In chapter 13, he had, uh, when the supper ended and Satan had put into the heart of Judas to betray him, the Bible tells us that Jesus rose from supper, girded himself with a towel, got a water basin, began to wash the feet of his disciples. You remember that passage. And as he did so, he said, um, uh, he had he started washing the feet of, the, of his men, and, and he came to his apostle, the apostle Peter, and, and Peter said, are you washing my feet? And he says, he says, you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus said to him, if I don't wash your feet, you have nothing to do with me. And that's when Peter said, give me a complete bath, you know, wash my head, my hands, just give me a bath. And Jesus said, you know, the one who has been washed, um, you know, if you've had a bath, all you need to do is wash your feet. And he began to give them some instructions concerning what it meant and what he was doing for them. And that's when Judas had arisen to betray him. And, and that's when Jesus um, was, was just making it very plain that, that it was about to happen. He was going to die. <coughs> He had told the apostle Peter that Peter was going to deny that all of them were going to forsake him. He didn't, they didn't appreciate that. And uh, Peter in, in chapter 14, verse 1, uh, made it very clear. You believe in God, he said. Believe also in me. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. And he went on to share with them places of comfort and, and homes that God had for them, that they'd be a family in Christ and all, but it all was resting on belief. Believe. You believe in God, believe also in me. It's not your good works, is what Paul is saying. It isn't your good works, it's your faith in Christ. Salvation is a gift. It's not a payment that we receive by being good or doing good things. Because if I work for a wage, the wage is in a gift. When I get paid, I get paid that which I was owed. But grace is something that I receive even though I'm not owed it. So that's why you'd say to him who doesn't work but believes, well, that's how it happens. He says there's a, a belief that is total in its commitment without wavering. The one who doesn't work for righteousness knows they need grace. And unless we re recognize that we really are ungodly, we'll never be saved. And so the point he's making is your faith results in righteousness. Unbelief results in judgment. The wages of sin, he says in chapter 6, is death. But in John 3, 36, Jesus said, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. And so he's developing this for us. In verse 6, he continues by saying, Just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. Now from Abraham, Paul speaks of one of his descendants. He speaks of King David. Now, David would know something of the joy of forgiveness. You see, what, what Paul begins to do here is he begins to quote out of Psalm 32. Now, remember the story of King David. King David was one of the most amazing men in Scripture. King David was a warrior king. King David was a man who, from the time he was a youth, had faith and courage. We all think of him in terms of the things that he did as a youth, especially when he had that uh, 
hand-to-hand -hand basic combat with Goliath. You know, and Goliath was not just a man. Goliath was a nine-foot, nine-inch man. He was a giant, about four feet taller than I am. That's, 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 a, that's a big boy. David wasn't afraid of him. I'm not going to go through the whole story. You know it. But he had no fear of him. Remember how he had come and he had seen this giant swaggering out there in front of the army of the Philistines? Remember how, how David looks at this guy and it's the guy is blaspheming the God of Israel? And David says, who is this guy? You know, David had that kind of attitude that you can't help but rally behind. Who is this guy? You know, this uncircumcised Philistine. I mean, he was a tough little dude, this guy, David. And so they start talking to him. His older brother says, oh, you're a naughty boy. That's King James. You've come out here just to see the war, you know, the battles. And what are you talking about? What have I done to you? And so there's an argument that goes on. We know the story. Ultimately, King David goes and he battles with this giant and in the name of God. He took him out with a stone. He had four other stones there because Goliath had brothers. He was going to take the family out at one time. That was David. I like him. I'd like to hang around with a guy like David. So we know that story. It's a, it's a story all of us were raised on if we were raised in the church at all. But, you know, he's very famous. If I were to say to somebody, I'd say, tell me about King David. They might come up with Goliath. They might, David and Goliath they're more than likely going to come up with another name. What's that other name? Bathsheba. Bathsheba. What is David remembered for? Slaying Goliath? No, he's remembered for taking Uriah, the Hittite's wife, putting him on the front lines, and he died. And not only did David steal his wife, impregnate her, but he also put her husband in the front lines for him to die. What do we remember about David? It's his sin. His sin. And David didn't forget it either. In Psalm 32, verses 3 through 5, he wrote, When I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. I acknowledge my sin to you. My iniquity I haven't hidden. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. And so that's why he could say in verse 7, Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. That's why he could say that. You see, his sin was ever before him. It was something that he couldn't forget. He had done something that was that terribly evil. And he said, I was drying up. The vitality of my, my, my life was drying up like I'm in the desert and, and it's a plant that requires liquid and yet it's, it's dying because it doesn't have that. And what did I do? As I'm drying up, I confess my transgression and you forgave me. You see, David was guilty of terrible sin and doing no good work would make him righteous. He was made righteous because God forgave him of all of his sin and that brought relief and that brought joy. When people are wanting peace with God and when they're wanting peace, when they're wanting joy, when they want love, they ought to run first to God because he's the source of those things. In Jesus, you have peace. Through Jesus, you have love. You know, in Christ, you have hope. You know, he casts out the fear that we have because we have trust in him. That's why he said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. That's why he would say that. Instead of allowing myself to be moved here and there by the, the, the winds of, 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 of our day, the waves that, that can cause me to, to, to feel like I'm lost, I'm, I'm to be anchoring my hope in him. And so when David received forgiveness, he said, I have relief and I have joy. And that's what Paul is speaking about. David describes, verse 6, the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. Why? Because David received Forgiveness and grace from God. Now does, verse 9, this blessedness then come upon the circumcised of the Jewish only? Or upon the uncircumcised also? For we say that faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. How then was it accounted while he was circumcised or uncircumcised? 
not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had, while still uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all those who believe, though they are uncircumcised, that righteousness might be imputed to them also. And the father of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision, but who also walk in the steps of the faith which our father Abraham had while still uncircumcised. So Paul is writing, in the way that he's writing, Bible scholars have pointed this out, he's actually writing in a way anticipating questions to what he's saying. And so he's anticipating something here. And the question that he anticipated is this, if Abraham was justified by faith, why then did he have to be circumcised? And then the question would contain a question about Gentiles. What about them? They aren't circumcised. How can they be saved? Now, does the joy of forgiveness come only upon those who are Jews, those who are circumcised? Circumcision. Circumcision was the symbol of God's promise to Abraham and his seed. When you read the book of Genesis, it's found in chapter 17, verses 9 through 14. In verses 10 and 11, God said, This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and your descendants after you. Every male child among you shall be circumcised, and you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. Now, circumcision is never presented as the action that saved Abraham. That's because we're not saved by religious ritual. I wonder how many in this room went through religious rituals. I did. I guess many of us did, right? I received water baptism when I was, let's see, from August, about four or five months old. My mom took me to Los Angeles to a little church, the Plaza Church there by Alvera Street, where every Mexican in California was baptized. <laughs> I was baptized there. I went to catechism. At the age of eight, I made my first communion. At the age of 12, I made my confirmation. So I went through religious rituals like many of you did, whatever your background may be. Mine was Catholic. Yours could be whatever it was. But I went through religious rituals. Was I saved by the rituals? Was I saved through the sacrament of penance when I went and made my confession to the priest? by the baptism, confirmation. No, religious ritual, we know this, but religious ritual doesn't save you. Religious ritual doesn't do that at all. As a matter of fact, sometimes it makes it harder for you to be saved because you trust in the ritual and not the one who saves you. So circumcision is never presented as the action that saved him. Why? Because it was by his faith that he was saved. In Galatians 5, verse 6, it says, In Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Well, he says in verse 10, how then was it accounted? While he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. Again, was Abraham regarded as righteous before or after his circumcision? And that's a good question. Was he regarded as righteous before he was circumcised or after he was circumcised? Because they're speaking concerning that covenant relationship with God through circumcision. And the answer is that Abraham was declared righteous 14 years before he was circumcised. In Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, that verse refers to him as righteous. But his circumcision was performed in Genesis 17, 23 through 25. That's a 14-year gap. He was already declared righteous, even though he was not yet circumcised. So, circumcision is a sign of a covenant with God. Circumcision is an open demonstration of the men, especially being part of the people of God. But the answer is, it is not the physical circumcision. It is 
the circumcision of the heart. In Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 10, verse 16, we read, Circumcise, therefore, the foreskin of your heart, and be no more stiff-necked. So Gentiles could have a relationship with God because their heart was circumcised. In Colossians 2, 11, it says, In whom also you are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of of Christ. Christ has actually circumcised your heart. So Abraham received the righteousness of faith while he was still uncircumcised. That's why he can be referred to as the father of all who believe, both the Jew and the Gentile. The Jew and the Gentile are both saved in the same way by putting their faith in Jesus Christ. I've mentioned to you number of times that uh, <clears throat> in Scripture, people, you really don't want, I'll say it this way real quick, this is just as an aside, to be honest with you, but in Scripture, you really don't see races as important. You don't see that. What you see is whether you know God or whether you don't know God. And the way that was originally broken down was in the Old Testament, you had the Jew and the Gentile. As we went through Ephesians, Paul had pointed out in the book of Ephesians that the Gentiles are without God and without hope in the world. But he said the Jews were the ones who were the recipients of the promises of God, and so God has special relationship with the nation of Israel. The symbol of that relationship, one of them, was circumcision. Circumcision was performed on the eighth day. Every male child was to be circumcised. It was a sign of the covenant. But because the Gentiles are without God in the world, how could they become right with God? And so in the New Testament, you have uh, humanity divided in a different way. You have Jew, you have Gentile, and you have the church of God. So the church of God is made up of both Jew and Gentile. Now, how does that church come into existence? By faith in Jesus Christ that brings us to relationship with God. And so it doesn't matter if you're of Jewish ex extraction or a Gentile of any extraction. That's not the question. The question is, is your heart circumcised? The question is, are you right with God? And that's what the New Testament presents to us. And so when they practiced circumcision, there were three reasons for it. It was an outward sign of willingness to obey God. It was evidence of faith because it was a constant reminder and it was a promise to those who had a similar kind of faith in the Lord. And so he says in verse 13, the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void and the promise made of no effect because the law brings about wrath for where there is no law, there's no transgression. And so Abraham is the father of all who follow his steps. Abraham is the father of all who trust in God. And it's not limited only to those who are physically circumcised. And the promise to become right with God is not fulfilled because he followed the law of Moses because Abraham predated the law by hundreds of years. Abraham is heir of the world because by faith he received the promises of God. In Galatians 3, 16 and 17, it says the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. Scripture does not say unto seeds, meaning many people, but unto your seed, meaning one person who is Christ. What I mean is this. The law, the law of Moses, introduced 430 years later, does not set aside the covenant previously established by God and thus do away with the promise. We've always been saved by faith. That's the whole point. You see, in Genesis, Abraham received a promise that contained elements. He, he would be, according to Genesis 12, 3, he'd be a blessing to all people through his descendants because in Genesis 12, 3, God had said to him, in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. He received the promise in Genesis 13, 16 that his descendants would be numerous. God said, I'll make your descendants as the dust of the earth so that if a man could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants also could be numbered. In Genesis 15, 18 through 21, he was promised a land 
a land of promise that stretched from the Nile to the Euphrates. And in Genesis 17, 6 through 8, God said, you will be the father of many nations. In Genesis 22, 8, his descend, from his descendants would come Messiah. And that's what happened. Remember when Abraham was given the command to take his son, his only son Isaac, and to sacrifice him on the mount in the place that he would designate? Do you remember how he heard that command? And when you read the scripture concerning that, it's really, it's an amazing thing to me how that you don't see him getting real upset about that. You just see him getting up, saddling a donkey, and taking off the next day. So he wasn't upset about being commanded to kill Isaac. Now, there are many people who wonder how old Isaac was at that time. I'd say he's probably a teenager because it would have been easier to kill him. <laughs> anyway, he probably thought about that a lot of times. I'm going to kill this kid. But he went up, right? He went up with him. He took him to the place. Remember how Isaac said, uh, Father, here I see, I see the wood and all the things in preparation of, of a burnt offering. He said, but where's the sacrifice? Where's the sacrifice? And Abraham is looking at his son thinking, it's you. And that, that, would, that would be tough. I think, uh, how could you do that? But Abraham said this in Genesis 22, verse 8. He said, my son. God will provide himself the lamb for a burnt offering. The Messiah, God will provide himself. Not for himself. Some Bibles add the word for, and I'm not sure why. No, the literal reading is God will provide himself a lamb. Who is the lamb? Jesus. Jesus. Abraham, I've given you a test. I've put you to the test and you have passed with flying colors. In the book of Hebrews, it speaks concerning Abraham and what motivated him. He said God had given, the writer said, God gave Abraham a child when he was as good, as good as dead. Remember, Abraham was 99 years old and his wife was 90, which she conceived. All right, ladies. <laughs> 90 years old. I don't even want to go there. So they were, it was impossible, and the writer says it, it would have been an impossible thing for this woman of this age, but God provided life in her womb, a womb that would have been dead. If God could provide life in a dead womb, Abraham believed that God could raise his son Isaac from the dead. That's powerful. Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him as righteousness. It was in his works, it was his trust. And that's what made him the father of many nations. And so he says, and finally in verse 15, it says, The law brings about wrath, for where there is no law, there is no transgression. The law cannot save you, because the law says thou shalt not do. And what that does is it names the sins that we practice. You're not to covet. You're not to, you know, uh, commit adultery, you're, you're not to steal, you're not to, to kill, you know, it tells us, it describes and defines, we'll see this later on in the book, it tells us what these things are, it labels and names these things. Some people say, well, you know, this is just the way that I am, well, maybe so, but the law tells you that that is wrong, and so that what is what it does, it reveals our sinfulness to us, and so the more you try to keep it, the more guilty you are because you can't. But he goes on in verse 15 and closes with this, where there's no law, there is no transgression. In other words, when God had made his promise to Abraham, the law was still in the future. The law was still future, so a conscious decision to break it wasn't possible at that time. And so, as he's developing this concerning Abraham, his faith, he's pointing people to the fact that God provided this lamb that your righteousness comes not because of the good works. Your righteousness comes because you believe, because you trust, because you've committed yourself, because you've received forgiveness. Your righteousness comes because it's imputed to you. It's given to you. He gives you something you didn't have when you give him something you did have.
when you give him your sin that he washes, he gives you his righteousness. And that comes by faith. It's not by works of righteousness which you've done. It's according to his mercy. He saved you. He washed you with the regeneration of the Holy Spirit. That's how it works, guys. And so I, I say that because it's very important. I'll close with this. It's very important for us to realize that if there's anything we need today in this world, it's people becoming aware of their own sinfulness and the ability of God to forgive them. There isn't a single sin I've ever committed that he can't forgive. His grace is beyond grace. Anything I can imagine. He, has never, he never fails. He never could fail. And when he sent his son Jesus to die on that cross, he took upon himself not just some of my sins. He took upon himself all of them. And he gave to me something I didn't have, his righteousness. And how did that come about? By my good works? No. By his grace. And that's what Paul wants us to know. And we'll close with that. He wants us to know that he's given us his grace. Our Father.